Hi everyone, this is the lecture to accompany chapter one in your textbook. You should watch this lecture first to get my insight into the chapter before completing the chapter one Learn Smart assignment. Okay, let's talk about interpersonal communication. Communication is so intrinsically tied to our everyday lives that we don't often think about it, we just do it. What would life be like if we didn't communicate? Well, it's very likely there wouldn't be any life, at least not human life as we know it. Communication is part of who we are as a species, and it's necessary to our very survival. Communication touches almost every aspect of our life and meets some very important needs. First, our physical needs. From the time we're born, we're social creatures. We need interaction with others. Obviously, a baby's physical needs, like being fed and kept clean and warm, have to be met by their parents or caretakers. But it's more than that. In the textbook, you'll read about the experiment carried out by the German Emperor Frederick II, who was curious about what language babies would speak if nobody spoke to them. So he instructed nurses in an orphanage not to speak to or hold the babies there, just feed and change them. He never did find out the answer to his question because all the babies died. Of course, that's an incredibly unethical experiment that would never be allowed these days. But it does point out that without the human communication of touch and language, babies can't thrive and develop. And of course, it's not just important when we're babies, but for our whole lives. We need strong social and intimate relationships in order to be mentally strong and even physically strong. People without strong social ties are more likely not just to feel lonely, but to suffer from more disease. Of course, some people seem to be fine with lesser levels of social interaction, but human communication does play a significant role in our well-being. Of course, communication is important in our relationships. Certainly, different relationships require different levels of interaction and intimacy, but our need for relationships is undeniable. People with richer social relationships, more and deeper friendships, report a higher level of satisfaction and happiness than those who say they don't have good friends to talk to. And people with satisfying intimate relationships also report being happier. And part of what makes a relationship satisfying is, of course, good communication. It also meets our identity needs. Many of the words we use to describe ourselves are the things that others have told us about ourselves. Are you funny? If you think you are, it's likely because others have laughed at what you said and told you that you were funny. Much of our own self-awareness and expression of our personal identity has been reflected back at us from the people around us, and that helps us to know ourselves. Communication meets our spiritual needs. By spiritual, I don't mean religious, although that could be a part of it. I'm talking about the values, morals, and ethics you hold. That comes from communication with those around you, your family, your culture, your friends. It's about the ideals you hold in your connection to the rest of humanity, the world and the universe, and the way you think about it and express it. And finally, communication meets instrumental needs, which are the pragmatic and practical needs we all have to have met to make it through the day. Like ordering coffee at Starbucks. You communicate with the barista to let her know you want a grande half-calf hot mocha with no whip. Or you ask a receptionist at the dentist's office where the bathroom is. Or you raise your hand to answer a question in class. Or you have an interview for a job you want. Or, well, I could go on forever. It's the most common need we meet through communication. And though you might not think it's as important as those other needs, of course it is. First, because there's so much of it. And second, because unless we get the basic things accomplished, we might not be able to fulfill the other needs on this list. Everything communication does for us is important. You've been communicating for your entire life, so you may be wondering what there is about it that you don't already know. Well, a lot of things, which is why you're in this class. Scholars have been studying communication for many years, and during that time they've used three models to determine how communication works. These are the action model, in which communication travels in one direction from speaker to listener, the interaction model, that shows how communication flows back and forth between the speaker and listener, and the transaction model, in which communication is simultaneously moving back and forth. Let's look at all of those. All of the models have some things in common. There's a source, or a speaker, who has an idea they want to communicate. That's the message. 
They encode that message, in other words, they turn their idea into language and send it through a communication channel, which could be talking, texting, emailing, or any number of other ways. The receiver, or the listener, gets the message and decodes it to make sense out of it. Those things are always in any communication. Another thing that's always there is noise. Noise is anything that gets in the way of the message and affects the way in which it's interpreted. Noise can be physical, like music playing so loudly in the background that you really can't hear what someone's saying. It can be physiological, like if you're so sick or hungry that you have difficulty focusing on the message. Or it could even be mental, like if you're thinking about something else, it might be hard to focus on what someone is telling you. As you can see by this illustration, in the action model, the message is flowing from the source to the receiver. There are many situations in which this might happen, like the situation you're in right now. You're listening to this, but you can't respond back to me at this moment. This is a one-way communication from me to you. An email or text where you either don't need to respond or don't have time to respond would also be examples of the action model. Another model is the interaction model, which has all the elements of the action model, but in this one, people take turns being the speaker and the listener, and feedback becomes an important element. That is the listener's response to the message, and as you can see by this illustration, the communication takes place within certain circumstances called context. Why is this communication happening? What's its purpose? Who are these people and where are they? Answering those questions helps us to understand the context of the communication. When you're listening to a lecture in class, you raise your hand to ask a question and the professor calls on you. Then you become the speaker and she's the listener. In a situation like that, people take turns. Finally, the transaction model is probably the closest model to illustrate the way we communicate. In this model, both the parties in the conversation are simultaneously senders and receivers. Although we sometimes take turns when we communicate, we're mostly both speaking and listening at the same time, sending and receiving feedback at the same time. This is how much of our communication actually flows in real life. Communication also has many characteristics or features that you might not have considered previously. First, it relies on multiple channels. Remember, a channel is the means by which the message is transmitted. We might be right in front of someone when we're sending that message. And that face-to-face -face communication is what we call a channel-rich context, because both the sender and the receiver are using many ways to get the message across. Sight, hearing, and maybe even things like touch and smell. Things like Skype and FaceTime are also fairly channel-rich, but other things like text and emails would be considered more channel lean because you're only using your sight to read the words. So you have to try to determine the meaning without using your other senses. And that can sometimes lead to misunderstandings. Communication also passes through the listener's perceptual filters, which means we filter communication that comes to us through our perceptions, past experiences, any biases we have, and our beliefs. That's why the same message can be interpreted so differently by different people. I see this in class all the time. I'll give directions for an assignment that I think are very clear, but when I look at the assignments I get back, I can see that different people interpreted those directions very differently. Next, it's not just the words that give communication its meaning. It's people. Words are just symbols that are given meaning because we've all decided that that's what they mean. We say that language is arbitrary because people have changed the meanings of many words over time as well. What they meant in the past may not be what they mean today. For instance, the word pot means something to plant something in or to cook something in, and over the past half century it has also been used to refer to marijuana. Next, messages have both literal meanings and relational implications. The content dimension of a message is what the words literally mean when you put them all together in a sentence. But there's often another meaning attached to the message, if you're sending that message within the context of a relationship. The relational dimension is the underlying meaning that the message carries with it for that relationship. So if you're ordering Starbucks from a barista, there's probably not a relational dimension to that message. 
But if you're asking your significant other to please remember to put the toilet lid down, you're not just sending the message about putting the toilet lid down, you're probably also sending a message about the state of the relationship, which might include unspoken things like, you never put the toilet lid down, or it really bugs me that you don't seem to care about whether I get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and then fall in the toilet because you left it up. We often send messages unintentionally. While many communication scholars think that only deliberate messages qualify as communication, others disagree and say that if a receiver or listener perceives that you've sent a message, it's communication whether you intended it or not. So if you run to the store in the morning in your ripped jogging pants, a messy t-shirt, and slippers because you need some milk for your cereal, and you run into your old girlfriend from college, even though you don't mean to send the nonverbal message that you're kind of a mess, that may be the message that she perceives. Maybe you're not a mess generally, but just right at that moment you are. But regardless, it doesn't matter. That message has been sent and received. Finally, communication is governed by rules. These rules apply in social contexts. Some of them are explicit, meaning we were verbally taught them, like when your mom told you if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, or there's a clear articulation of them somewhere, like a sign on the wall of the library saying, quiet, please. But there are also implicit rules, which are rules that have never been clearly stated, but that we just know, usually from observation. Elevators are great places to observe implicit rules in action. Many people don't talk to anyone or even make eye contact on an elevator unless they got on with someone they were already talking to. Now, not everybody follows that implicit rule, but most people do. Let's go over a couple of myths about communication. First one, everyone is a communication expert. Well, just because you've been communicating all your life doesn't make you an expert. All of us can improve. I've been teaching communication for several decades and I'm still learning. Communication will solve any problem? Um, no. Although poor communication is at the root of many relationship issues, talking about the problem doesn't necessarily make the problem go away. It can certainly bring it out into the open where it can be dealt with, but that doesn't mean it's going to make the problem all better. Communication can break down? This is a poor metaphor because it's not that communication is broken, it's that it's being used ineffectively. Communication is inherently good? Well, I think we see examples of how this isn't true on a daily basis. Lots of messages are sent with ill intentions, and of course many are sent with good intentions as well. Communication is neither inherently good nor bad. It's why and how we use it that makes it so. Finally, is more communication always better? Definitely not. Think about all the Facebook arguments you've seen and how people can talk until they're blue in the face and nothing ever gets resolved. It's not about the amount of communication. It's about the effectiveness of the communication. You may have already taken another communication class, like public speaking or small group communication. But in this class, we're focused solely on interpersonal communication, which is defined here as communication that occurs between two people within the context of their relationship and that, as it evolves, helps them negotiate and define their relationship. So this kind of communication occurs between two people, also known as a dyad, who have some kind of relationship to one another, like a family member, a significant other, a friend, a work colleague, your boss or supervisor, people like that. Of course you also communicate interpersonally with people you don't have a relationship with, like the checker at the grocery store, but that's generally about fairly mundane things, and you may or may not ever see that person again. Communication within a relationship helps people negotiate and define the nature of that relationship, and that's really what this book focuses on. Unless you live under a rock, you have to communicate interpersonally. It's everywhere, and it's an integral part of any relationships you have. So it's a good idea to try to become a more effective communicator. It can improve those relationships, and there's a lot of evidence out there that it can actually improve your health. People who report having more close personal relationships also tend to report that they're happier and healthier than those with few 
or no close friend. So now that you know how important and how absolutely necessary effective communication skills are to you, let's talk about what it means to be a competent communicator. First, you need to become better at communicating effectively and appropriately. Effectiveness describes how well your communication achieves its goals. Does it accomplish what you wanted it to? Appropriateness describes how well your communication complies with the rules and expectations of the social situation that you're in. What might be perfectly fine to say in one setting might be incredibly rude or even offensive to say in another setting. So you need to be able to gauge a situation correctly. Good communicators have some characteristics and skills in common. They're self-monitoring. This means they have an understanding of how the people around them are perceiving them and they are aware of it. They are adaptable. They can change or adapt their behavior and message to different circumstances and different audiences. They have empathy, which is the ability to understand and feel what someone else is feeling. They have cognitive complexity. That's the ability to consider a variety of explanations of why someone does or says something in a given situation. So maybe that person who ignored you wasn't mad at you or stuck up. Maybe they simply didn't see you. And of course, a competent communicator is also an ethical one. They understand the difference between right and wrong and do their best to communicate fairly and honestly. So much of our communication today is not done face to face but online. Online communication brings another level of competencies that you need to understand and put into practice. First, you need to be keenly aware of the potential for misunderstanding. Because much of our communication online falls into the channel lean category and relies heavily on the written word, we don't have the nonverbal things like gestures and eye contact to help us decipher meaning. It's always a good idea to read over what you've written before you send it to make sure the meaning's clear. Using emoticons can also help someone interpret your message. Presuming that everything is permanent and nothing is secret. Sadly, the concept of personal privacy simply doesn't exist anymore, and some of you might be even too young to remember when it did exist, but these days everyone knows your business. And sometimes that's by accident because you accidentally send a text or email to the wrong person. Here's a good idea. Just assume that all the communication you've ever done online is permanent. That it never goes away. So before you send that message, you need to ask yourself, am I okay with this living forever in cyberspace? Also assume that there's no such thing as a secret told online that remains a secret. It's out there and somebody will find it, and everyone will know. And finally, avoid communicating in anger. Even if you think it's justified, those words last forever online. It can be very difficult to get past hurtful words written in anger. So cool down before you respond, then consider whether you even need to respond. In summary, we've looked at the nature of communication, why and how we do it, what interpersonal communication is, and ways in which we can become better communicators. You're now ready to complete the Chapter 1 Learn Smart Assignment.